Hello, welcome back to the workshop. Sorry it's been so long since I posted the video. I've been just busy with a couple of projects and not found time to fit the filming. And more so the editing. Filming part is really easy. It's uh, the time editing videos. I've got loads of content that I've filmed and you can look forward to that at some point in the future. But I just, yeah, a little bit of an update, let you know that I'm still here. It's actually the end of the day now, but I've filmed today in like a bit of a blog style. So a bit of content for you. A little bit of an update on the channel. I've been editing a, a full video together of the front door, the big green front door video. So if you've been watching that series, but it's not all, all tied together for you, uh, there's about a 40 minute video coming probably at this weekend um, of that whole run through. Anyway, let's go back to the start of today. When I filmed this thinking I was gonna do maybe a weekly blog and I've rabbited on so much, it's probably gonna turn into enough content for a single day. So uh, that's why I've remade the intro at the end of the day. Just thought I'd share this one with you quickly. I ordered a couple of custom made cutter blocks. I'll take you through unboxing them. I'm gonna have to blur out my address because it's written all over it. And it's not really possible to unbox this without you seeing it. Right, let's get in there. This one, there's two cutter blocks. Only one's turned up so far. This is a little special one I've had made for the custom green. So what I what I wanted from this was a really tall spiral cutter block. And these are the shear style cutter inserts so that they work on a shear cutting action. So they're a lot less stressful on the spindle mold and you get a lot cleaner finish from it at the same time. But I wanted a really tall cutter so I could do deep sill cuts. But I also wanted it so that I could recess the top nut of the spindle molder within the cutter block. And if I'm doing some really deep, I've done a few jobs lately where I needed a, a really deep 90 degree cut out of the back of something and the top nut always gets in the way. So I want to be able to recess that in and be able to cut all the way flush over the top of this thing, like a, like a tenon cutting disc almost. So I had them recess the top of this into this cutter block and uh, I have to say that looks absolutely stunning. The green, I was a bit cautious about the green. He sent me a picture and it looked really light and horrible, but that look, that is beautiful. Mean looking bit of kit. This was the inspiration for making this cutter block. I used this rebate block all the while. It's nice and light and easy to put in the spindle being small and made of alley. So it's, it's dead easy to pick up and handle. It's always sharp. These cutters seem to last forever. The carbide insert spur cutters. So it's always sharp. You always get a fantastic cut because they do produce a nicer cut anyway. Being smaller as a cutter block, because it's only a hundred mil diameter, you can get your fences really nice and close to the cutter. Even with a big rebate, you can get your fences in nice and close together, which reduces the snipe at the start and the ends of the cut. So really nice little cutter block. I do use it an awful lot. Um, I just wanted a bigger one. I wanted a taller cut for me, bigger rebates. I can do a bit of planing as well with this one. And like I say, recess them uh, sort of big angle cuts in using that bit on the top. So hopefully it will be a good investment. Working on a kitchen at the minute, just gonna start making the drawer boxes. I've made all the carcasses and doors and everything. Uh, this is my cut list. I've got a program on the computer, just like a numbers or an Excel file. And if you put the size of your face frame opening in, this is for a face frame kitchen where the carcass is the same size as the opening in the face frame. So everything's flush around the opening. If you put that size into my little spreadsheet here, put the depth in as well that you want will give you the cut list out the back of it and knock off the allowance. You always knock uh, six mil off each side in the width um, and the height. Forget what you knock off in the height, always forget. So this is why I made this spreadsheet, but it'll give you basically the bits of finished timber sizes that you need. So for um, six of them drawers at that size, it's punched out 12 bits that long and that wide and 12 at that and that. And there's, uh, Full list of drawers here, we've got plenty to go at. I've actually cut all this wood up. If you want that um, spreadsheet, it's a little bit of work to put it on my website, but if there's enough interest, I'll chuck it on there and make it available for download. This is a load of Wayne Edge oak from Sykes Timber. Cut all this up when I had a moment and put it back in so it acclimatized 
in the size of boards that I need. So all my cut list has actually already been generated. I've just got to drag it into the workshop and plane it up now. Okay, those are my bits of wood. Some of these are quite nice, actually. Nice bits of uh, European oak. And 20 mil thick as well, so I'm not going to waste too much finishing it at 15, which is uh, quite economical. So there's one drawer in this kitchen that's absolutely huge. It's 365 mil tall, so it's a whopper. Uh, I've got these boards that have held up for the 365s. They're actually like 390 in width as they sit here. But because it's 20 mil stock and I'm going to get a 15 mil finish, any minor deviation in them, like the straightness here, or a cup like there is in this end a little bit, it's just going to kill the thickness. It's not going to hold up. So what I'm planning to do is just rip it down into, say, three sections, avoiding any big knots. So like this one here, I'll probably just rip it in half through that point there, and then plane up the two halves. And that will allow me to plane it up without losing quite so much timber. And it's tending to crown, like this one here is particularly crowned in the center of like the core of the timber there. So if I just rip that down the middle, plane up the two halves, and then joint it back together, the, the joint line will be pretty much invisible because it is one piece of wood originally. And uh, I should get my finished size when I push it through the wide belt sander. <laughs> So I just pushed them through the plane. I managed to get a 16 and a half mil finish. I want a 15 mil finish on my draw side. And they all look pretty clean at 16 and a half. So that's perfect. I can glue them together and then push them under the wide belt to bring them down to 15 mil later on. It sort of looks seamless. There's a tiny bit, obviously you remove some material in the middle, but it's as seamless as you're going to get with a joint in there. You might be wondering why I'm using a domino. It's because the finger joint, glue joint block at this thickness, it sort of ends on a, on a chamfer at the face. And if you then plane or sand across that chamfer, it's quite likely if there's tiny bit without glue that that's going to create like a split or a shake in the timber that's really hard to deal with later on so just using dominoes and a butt joint to uh, glue these together and ideally you want a very very tiny spring joint in your board so the ends are touching and there's a hairline gap in the middle of the boards when you sort of put them together along the joint I'm just going to squeeze the majority of the glue out first and make sure it's clamped right afterwards. So just squeeze the glue out, get it so they're touching and wind the clamps off. Get two more clamps. No, I'll try and explain why I do that. So when you clamp these, any clamps, but especially these T-bar, they're all going to have a little bit of play in the jaw against this bar. So when you tighten up, um, the pressures exerted tend to pull the jaw away from the bar and you get this little gap. If you clamp one side first and do it up fairly tight, even if you turn it over and put a clamp on the other side of the board, you'll find that it will not pull the curve that you've clamped into it out of the board. So what I tend to do, uh, the first clamp that you do up, get it so it's tight, 
and then just undo it enough. Move this out of the way so you can see. Undo that first clamp enough so that you can push down on the board and up on this clamp. So it pulls it, it takes all the slack out of it in uh, like one operation with this hand. And then I tighten the clamp up, but nice and tight this end, obviously left this end tight. So then coming back to the clamp head side, I'm pushing the board away so it remains in that place at that end, it doesn't affect that end. I'm also going to push down on this board so it hits the clamp bar and it's tight at this end and pull the clamp head up for all in one operation with this hand and then just re-tighten that one. Just do it enough so it holds it. If you go any more tension than just holding it, you start to bend the board. It makes it really difficult to do the same procedure with this one. So I'm going to push down on the clamp heads here so that it, push, it takes all the slack out and the board is tight against the clamp. I assume you can see down there, yeah. And then as you can see that's left a little bit of a gap here. That, I mean, the boards have planed off a little bit inconsistently, so there might be a tiny gap, but we can pull that board up as much as possible. And it's flat along there, so I'm quite happy with that. Once both end clamps are in place and both straight with the boards, you'll find that they're dead straight with the clamp backs and you can wind the pressure up and do them at the same time and really clamp that pressure up so you get as much clamping force as you possibly can out your clamps for gluing boards like this together. See that can be our nugget of info for today's video is uh, make sure your clamps are dead tight around your board. You can actually use quick grips. I used to use a, a quick grip clamp to pull them nice and tight but if you're if your bar clamps are fairly straight and they're clamped both sides tight to it, the boards kind of are forced to glue up straight within it. So uh, it's quite a nice little technique to get used to using when you're gluing boards together. I really like the T-bar clamps. I'd recommend anyone starting out in woodworking, buy the T-bar clamps. When you're clamping stuff together, you want a proper solid metal clamp and something that just, just works not plasticky, gimmicky things. Gold scrapers scraped every bit of glue off or board that I've glued together in its life. It's never been sharpened or replaced. So we've well, got the best, but it's perfect for that job. The theory of using a scraper is actually uh, just to prevent any possible chance of damage on these boards. If you come in with a chisel, slice these glue lines off, it's really easy for that edge to kind of catch into the wood like there. And if it's a brittle bit of wood, it starts peeling the piece of wood off. And if you're gonna sand that to a finish, that's a real problem. You're gonna have to fill or really sand something like that out. So the scraper just gives you an absolute guarantee that you're just basically pushing the glue off the surface and almost advancing the finish to a better level than you started with before by scraping it after the glue up. Plus it's really quick and it doesn't gum your chisels up with glue if it's like slightly not gone off everywhere in that sort of thick bead and it goes on the scraper, it doesn't matter in any way. They are pretty nice and flat. Definitely saved a lot of material there by making them smaller, planning them up, gluing them back together, rather than trying to get that finished board out of the full width of bowed piece of timber. Thanks for watching, see you in the next one.